on the subject of the dinosaurs, and they don't know where it fits in in the Bible. So tonight we're going to take a look at it. You know, some very puzzling bits of information about the dinosaurs have been discovered over the years. And a lot of people think to themselves, well, how does this fit? You know, when you put the pieces together, it's still possible not to get it right. You know, there's been several dinosaurs that they found part of the skeletons, and they put them together, and it looked entirely different to what it did once they got the, the whole set of bones. It looked entirely different. So it, it's possible to have all the pieces but still get it together wrong. So what is the truth about the dinosaurs? We're going to look tonight and see if we can find out. National Pornographic Geographic right. <laughs> says uh, no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. <coughs> Well, now, does he know that, or does he think that? He think that. I mean, unless he's talked to everybody that's ever lived, how would he know that? He don't. I mean, he, I'm pretty sure he didn't talk to Adam. I know he hadn't asked me if I've, if I've seen a live dinosaur. Has he asked any of you guys? No. No. And uh, some friends of mine, you know, I asked them, and they said, I know they didn't ask the king, baby. You know who they were, I know that person. You know that guy? Yeah. yeah. Well, he knows they didn't ask him. Then I asked my other friend. <laughs> they asked him, and he says, no way, Jose. <laughs> so what is the truth about the dinosaurs? You know, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that in them is. So if he made all that in them is, that includes the dinosaurs, wouldn't it? Amen. If he made everything, it would have to include the dinosaurs. So Adam must have seen dinosaurs. And God in creation, he said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the water from the waters. This is the start of day two. And we looked a couple weeks ago at the canopy theory where uh, it's believed that at creation, where God separated the waters from the water, there was probably a canopy of water that went around the earth that would have, you know, helped to filter X-ray radiation and block UV radiation, several of the other radiations, and uh, that would have drastically added to man's lifespan during, there in the garden. And there's a few planets today that have canopies around them in outer space. Not anything as pronounced as what we believe that uh, the Earth had, but interesting theory anyway. And a lot of the water from the flood, I believe, probably came from the canopy also when it, you know, it says the fountains of the deep broke open. And the theory is that it shot up about 10 or 12 miles up and fractured the uh, canopy that went around the earth. And as it fell, it uh, probably added to the rainwater. I don't think all the water from the flood came from the canopy, but a lot of it probably, and from the inside of the earth. And before the flood, you know, the average lifespan of a man was 912 years old. And today it's about 70 to 80 years old. You can learn a lot in 900 years. Adam, like I said a few weeks ago, learned a lot. He spoke every language in the world. There's only one, but he spoke it. Amen. And as we look at how long people live, we want to notice also that the animals were living longer too. This school book says the biggest pterosaur flying over the inland sea is a pteranodon, and like all reptiles, it grows throughout its life. Dinosaurs were really just big lizards that lived in the garden with Adam and Eve. And if they were in the garden with Adam and Eve, you might be wondering, did Noah take them on the ark? Do you think it's possible Noah took dinosaurs on the ark? Yeah. I, I think it's entirely possible. Billy Graham, somebody wrote in and asked him, he said, they asked where the dinosaurs were on the ark, and he said, uh, but no, Noah's ark apparently did not include dinosaurs. The reason is because dinosaurs and similar ancient creatures were known by fossils. We know by fossils were extinct by the time that God created the flood. How were they extinct before the flood? I mean, this is supposed to be a man of God here, but uh, he believes in the gap theory and, and the day-age theory which he believes that, you know, before uh, Adam and Eve, there was a, a gap in history where God had created all these animals through evolution. Well, that's just stupid. You know, Noah was 600 years old when he went in the ark. He would have known how to handle it. You know, he would have known that you didn't have to take the biggest dinosaur you could find on the ark. You could take a couple of babies, make sure you got a pink one and a blue one. That'd be important a little later on. 
And there's some very practical reasons why he would have brought babies. One, they're smaller. You know the biggest dinosaur ever found was just the size of a football? You could get an awfully big dinosaur out of just a small egg. So, you know, when they're babies, they're, they're pretty little. So why bring babies? They're smaller, you know. They weigh a lot less, make it easier. They eat a whole lot less. They sleep a lot more. They're a lot tougher. Even kids today, you know, if kids are running around here and they fall, they bounce and get back up. Some of us old people, if we fall down, we break or lay there and moan for a while. <laughs> and it gets worse the older we get. And after the flood, they would have lived longer. They would have been able to produce a lot more babies to get the population back up. So there's, there's a lot of practical reasons why Noah would have brought them. You know, and you wouldn't want to bring the biggest thing you could find. Why would you bring a giant elephant? He, most of his animals were probably smaller, baby-type animals. You know, you wouldn't want to bring a huge elephant or a giant giraffe. You know, you'd save room. You'd get a lot more on the ark. And Noah didn't have to bring two of every species. That's a scientific word. You know, God told him to bring two of every sort. You know, the basic kinds. And like he says, you know, and they, every beast after his kind. You know, the creeping thing after his kind. Two of every sort, wherein is the breath of life. So he wouldn't have had to bring the fish. They had plenty of water outside. So he didn't have to bring any ocean or sea animals. He wouldn't have had to bring... Oh, also it says, and whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land. So he wouldn't have had to bring any insects. Does anybody know why he wouldn't have had to bring any insects? Not you, son. That's cheating. They lived on the fur of the other animals? No. Insects breathe through their skin through spiracles. They don't have the breath in their nostrils. They breathe through their skin. So it would have saved a huge amount of, of room there. And Noah didn't have to take 400 different pairs of dogs on the ark, you know, probably just two of each, you know, a basic kind. Probably the wolf, the coyote, the dingo, and the dog probably all had a common ancestor, so he wouldn't have had to bring all 450 varieties of dogs. See, like this right here, all the dogs in the world come from a, a common ancestor, but uh, is a dog. This is my dog, Blue. Blue's a canardly. You can, call, can hardly tell what kind he is. <laughs> and the horse, the hippo, the zebra, the donkey. You know, he would have had to bring a different sort of every one of them, just a basic horse pair. And, you know, they would have filtered out later on. They all had a common ancestor, but it was a horse. And a lot of skeptics says, well, how did Noah fit millions of animals on the ark? Well, no, I didn't build millions of animals on the ark. You know, he only had to bring the land animals, no fish, no bugs. Probably brought babies. And he brought two of every variety, uh, two of each kind, not every variety. And God made the different kinds, you know. And God told him how big to build it, so he didn't know how big it would take to, to fit everything on there. And there's only 8,000 basic kinds of animals today. And if God had told him to take the dinosaurs, which he probably did, that might have made, what, 10,000 basic kinds at the most. So the ark was plenty big, plenty big enough. Um, but skeptics also say, you know, that God would, or Adam would have been able to name all the animals in one day. They have a real problem with that. Because it says God brought the animals to, Noah, or to Adam and he named them all. You think he had a problem doing that in one day? No. There, like I said, there's only 8,000 basic pairs. And if he was to speak 300 words a minute, which is very possible, people can speak 300 words a minute, he could have done it in 26 minutes. And if he just named one a second, you know, he could have done it in two and a, two and a quarter hours. You know, the Bible's accurate when it says stuff. Amen. We don't have to worry about it. You know, God tells us what to do. We just need to figure out the details. <laughs> You know, how big was the ark? You know, it was plenty big enough. And the Bible answers all the questions we have, whereas the evolutionist has a problem. They say 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the energy in the world and matter was sucked into a little small period, a uh, little spot in space, about the size of a period on a piece of paper. That was the Big Bang. 
And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. And the earth's surface was a hot, uh, bubbling mass of lava. And it started to rain and oceans formed on the rocks over billions of years. Over millions of years, I'm sorry. And uh, there was torrential rains there. And in these big, vast oceans where it had rained for millions of years, it says, swirling in the waters of the oceans, a bubbling broth of complex, uh, complex chemicals. Uh, some of them are carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids, the chemicals of life. However, the progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Well, yeah, I'd say it's slow. It never happened. But yet they say the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. Well, okay. Was uh, your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa soup? And if no. so, what flavor? <laughs> and a lot of these guys, they'll come up and say, uh, listen, buddy, do you really believe that Noah took all 400, or actually that all the dogs in the world today, there's over 450 varieties, came from two dogs on Noah's Ark? And I like to remind them, well, listen, that's not nearly as bad as what you believe. You believe that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. Because isn't that what they believe? It rained on the rocks for billions of years and then the rainwater come alive? That, that's what they believe. You know, I think this right here is probably the evolutionist life verse. Saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. Isn't that pretty much what they believe? I found my mom's life verse in the Bible. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic <laughs> and sore vexed. Well, the Bible tells us the earth was also corrupt before God and filled with violence. And uh, God repented in making the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them, uh, destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. So Noah went to his sons and said, Sons, listen, we've got to build an ark, so you go for wood. Mm -hmm. Fine. Go wood. <laughs> yep. And uh, after the flood, Noah had a son named, or grandson named Arphaxed. That was Shem's boy. Who would name their kid Arphaxed? I mean, can't you see this kid in school if there was schools? Uh, what's your name, son? It's Art Max Ed. How do you spell that? Well, I don't know. Nobody does. But anyway, you've got to figure that. There wasn't a lot of people in the world. So one of these days, Art Max Ed's going to be on Granddaddy Noah's at laugh going, Hey, uh, why are we the only ones around here? And uh, he's going to have to sit down and tell him the story of the flood. And he had a son named Shem. God's always kept a witness around to tell what's happened. Amen. You know, did you know Shem lived long enough after the flood that he could have told the flood story firsthand to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God has always kept a witness here. Somebody says, hey, uh, was there really a flood? Well, I don't know. Let's go ask Shem. He's still alive. So, you know, there's plenty of evidence. And today, there's 270 surviving flood stories. Why do you suppose that is? You know, the Hawaiians say, long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu. He made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed the people. Only Nu and his family survived. The Chinese have a story called the Hiking Classic. It says that Fu Hai and his wife and three sons and three daughters escaped a great flood, and he and his family were the only people left alive on earth. They had to repopulate the world. The Toltec Indians said that the first world lasted 1,716 years old and was destroyed by a great flood that covered the highest mountains. They said only uh, one family named Cox Cox survived. Now, why do you suppose there's so many flood stories where the whole world was destroyed? Do you think maybe it's because there was a flood? I mean, it tends to make sense to me. And it wasn't one of these localized floods, like people like Hugh Ross is going around <coughs> saying. Uh, how many of you guys have heard that it was a local flood over in the Mesopotamia area? The water just come up and 
peacefully drowned everybody and went back down. Now, if that's the case, then why in the world would God tell Noah to build that big boat, fill it with animals, stay on it a year? Just tell Noah to move. I mean, it's not hard to figure that out. And, you know, the Bible, if you had the dates up, it says it puts the flood of, at the year 1656. The Toltec Indians said it was uh, 1,716 years old. That's only a difference of, like, uh, a very short, short amount. 44. 44. Not a very big difference for a story over 4,000 years old. Well, anyway, if you read the story about Noah... You hear that it landed in Mount Ararat. And if you look on a map of, of Turkey, you, you'll see Mount, Mount Ararat there. But if you look on a Turkish map in their own language, you'll find it called Noam Gumsi, which means Noah's big boat. Uh -huh. And there's a street sign there pointing to where it's at. Everybody over there knows where it's at. They've been there and looked at it. Um, they can't really visit the visiting center anymore because there's been so much trouble with different tribes in the area, Kurds and such. But the Bible tells us the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains of Ararat. And if you notice, it says the mountains of Ararat. It doesn't say it landed on Mount Ararat. See, a lot of explorers have looked on Mount Ararat for Noah's ark, and they say, uh, well, we was up there and we almost found it. How do you almost find something? You either find it or you don't. But uh, we'll go back next year and look some more. Just give us more money. We'll, we'll go look. And there's four, four theories about what happened to the Noah's Ark and its location. One of the theories is it was taken apart and the lumber was used to build houses and buildings and some such. Other theory says it rotted. One theory says it's still on the mountain. And another theory says it's in the valley. Now there's some good evidence for each one of those theories. I'll tell you which one I believe in a little bit, but... You know, you can kind of see everybody's viewpoint on that a little. But this is Mount Ararat. It looks very pretty, you know, in the picture here. And a lot of people think Noah's Ark is up on Mount Ararat. They think this is a picture of it. But I've got to ask you, what in the world is that ark doing in a gorge that wasn't there until 1840? The mountain erupted and blew away the side of the mountain. So why would the ark still be sitting there if it was... Where the, arc, or where the volcano erupted. It wouldn't be there. I think they're looking in the wrong spot if they're looking there. And other people think it's down in the valley. They think this is Noah's Ark. And I tend to agree with them. All the evidence I've ever looked at about it um, makes me believe that. A lot of people say, well, that's just a mud flow or a lava flow. When mud flows down a hill, it always makes a shape like that. Well, to some extent it does. But if you ever see it, if you see a lava flow or mud flow, you'll notice that the uh, rounded end is always at the top. And the pointed end is always in the back. Well, the pointed end is pointing uphill on this one. That's not a lava flow. Uh, I knew uh, Ron Wyatt, the man who'd done the research on the ark, and he's a very credible man. I believe him. He died a few years ago, and Richard Reeves has uh, took over his, his uh, research. I met Richard down below Nashville, Tennessee a few years ago, and he actually went into the vault and got out the pieces that they believe is the ark and let me hold them. I mean, it was very exciting to hold something that potentially could be part of Noah's ark. <clears throat> There's the Wyatt Archaeological Museum. Kind of small place, but it's really interesting if you go there and look at some of the things they have. But anyway, the, the thing I just showed you is the approximate size of the ark. It's 138 feet wide. It's a little wider than the ark, but like any old ship, they've dug up several old ships, and they found out that as they rotted, they kind of splay out to the side, and the, the width increases because where it's, it's opened up. And it's collapsed in on itself. We can't expect a 4,000-year-old boat to be in mint condition. But all over the area where they found this thing, they found these iron rivets, and even the centerpiece right here is beveled around the edges so it won't slip out of the rivet. And you can go down to Nashville, the Archaeological Museum, and look at the iron rivets. They got them there. They found fossilized animal manure and uh, antlers and different animal bones around that area. A whole lot of interesting things have been found at this site. The Turkish government even is willing to say that that is Noah's Ark. They went so far as to build a visiting center. 
And I don't think a government's going to waste a lot of money to build something like that if they don't believe they've got it. And uh, I've read some articles from different people. Creation Magazine, which is a really good magazine, they published some articles that kind of harsh to say it's not, but I, I don't think they really looked at all the evidence. Because um, if you read what they've said, it, it doesn't fit up with all the research that's been done on it. I think that, you know, do so favor if they were to take another look at it. But the length of the ark, the Bible says, should be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. And how big is a cubit? Anybody know? No? The Hebrew cubit was about 18 inches. The one that they used most of the time was about 18 inches. But the Egyptian cubit was almost 21 inches long, <clears throat> which uh, I believe is the size of the ark because Moses, or Noah, not Noah, Moses, wrote the book of Genesis. And Genesis was schooled in all the, you know, science of the Egyptians. So it only stands to reason, since he was raised up with the Egyptians, that he would have used their measurement. And that comes to 515 feet long. And that's what this coach shaped object is. It's 515 feet long. The dimensions that the Bible calls for the ark to have been. Anyway, it's like two-thirds the size of the uh, Titanic. And you can see that there's plenty of room in that thing. Here's what an animal, like a brachiosaurus, would have looked like compared to it. And if he took smaller ones, plenty of room there. And around that area, they found several of these giant stones, uh, roughly 9,000 pounds each. I believe they found 12 of them so far. I think it's kind of an interesting number, 12 stones. And they all drilled through here. They've got a hole in them. Uh, they were probably used as anchor stones or drogue stones. And you might wonder what a drogue stone would have been used for. It was to keep the, the vessel stabilized. So if it was going into the wind, uh, it would have caused the, the ship to turn and it went parallel with the wind. And it would have kept it stabilized and it wouldn't capsize. Your boat would have been balanced. One guy said, you're so stupid. Don't you know if he had rocks hanging all over his boat, it would have slowed him down? He wasn't trying to go anywhere. He was just trying to float. I mean, and this one guy, he's a preacher. He said, you know, uh, he turned atheist. He said, Noah couldn't have made a ship that was 300 feet long. It would have bent and twisted in the middle. It would have broke. Well, lots of people have made ships that's over 300 feet long. See, Noah's Ark wouldn't have been a masting ship. It wouldn't have had sails and masts on it. You know, the wind wouldn't have caught it and twisted it. It would have, it would have been just fine. Lots of people, the Chinese used to make ships over 300 feet long. There's no problem with the architecture of this boat. It would have floated. It wouldn't have twisted. It wouldn't have broken. Johnny, the other thing was, would they have a lot better than something we got? Absolutely. Gopher. Yep, and nobody knows for sure what gopher wood is today, but the wood that was found at this site had a lamination over it. Uh, probably where he pitched it within and without. And does anybody know what that pitch would have been? Because you got to, people say, uh, well, if you believe the Bible, then there wasn't any pitch till after the flood. I think the pitch was tree sap. That's tree exactly sap, right. what it was. And there was ways Noah could have got around this real easy, even if he, if there was a danger of it uh, twisting. He could have built a moon pool. Does anybody know what a moon pool is? A moon pool is almost shaped like a piston. You wall up a hole inside. And uh, when the, the water and the waves come up, it makes the water level go up and down and it would pump air throughout the whole ship. And uh, Noah was pretty smart. He could have had sense enough to do this. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us he did. And I'm not saying that he definitely did. But he could have built a moon pool in it and it would have been fine. And you know, you might have prayed for a little fresh air, you know, around feeding time. Lord, we're getting ready to feed the elephants. So uh, we get a little wave here. Yeah. So it'd make a good stress relief for the ship too. Air circulation and a place to dump refuse. Think you might need to dump something overboard? Yeah, probably so. Well, if the Bible's true and man lived with dinosaurs before the flood, what happened to the dinosaurs when they got off the ark? The science book it will tell you that a, a meteorite or a comet probably hit the Yucatan Peninsula and <coughs> caused all the dinosaurs to die. That had done it. Huh? That had done it. Yeah, okay. No. 
this guy's got a really good uh, theory here. He says, uh, the dinosaurs killed themselves off with their own flatulence that they couldn't stand the heat. They caused greenhouse gases and they couldn't stand the heat. I, I don't know what to say about theory like that. So I'm just, I'm just gonna move on. Flatulence gas? Yeah. This theory is as good as any. Smoked themselves into extinction. And a lot of times, you know, they, they ask the questions, they ask the wrong questions. They'll ask you, do you think the dinosaur, what made the dinosaurs go extinct? Well, they need to be asking, did they go extinct? I don't think they did. I think they lived along with man all along. You know, after the flood, they probably began to die off because of the harsh climate changes. Their food system was a lot different. You know, there's less of it. And a lot of the big ones probably didn't have anything to eat. So I believe a lot of them died off. But a few of them, I think, probably survived. Dinosaurs had two problems after the flood. Like I said, a lot of them died off due to climate changes and their food. And the second problem they had was probably people hunting them. You know, killing them all. You know, you don't want to live next door to a dinosaur, would you? I mean, they have hazards. You know, they could have killed them off for meat because they were a menace, because somebody wanted to be a hero. You know, somebody might want to prove his superiority, a competition, and uh, medicinal purposes. Do you know there's all kinds of ancient recipes for medicine that says you need dragon bones or dragon teeth or different things for it? Just like you could go down to the store and pick up some. Hey, you need some dragon bone. Oh, okay. And there's thousands of legends of people seeing dragons and killing dragons. The word dinosaur was invented by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. And before that time, they were known as dragons. In 1891, the dinosaur still wasn't in the American Dictionary. But the word dragon in 1946 was, look what it says, the first one, a dragon, now rare. 1946, didn't say they didn't exist, it said they were rare. <clears throat> and the Bible called them dragons, because the dinosaur wasn't there, it said the wine of the poison of the dragons. <coughs> Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the water. Dragons are mentioned 34 times in the Bible, and I know there's a place or two where it's referring to a jackal. When it talks, I don't know how you get dragon out of jackal, but anyway. And notice it said some of the dragons were in the water. But as the population began to go up of the humans, the population of the dinosaurs began to go down. You know, just say, for instance, like the grizzly bear. How many grizzly bears do we have around Clarksville area today? Probably none, right? But about 500 years ago, you think there was probably some then? Yeah. Probably a whole lot. If it came on the 6 o'clock news tonight that five grizzly bears have been seen in Montgomery County, by 5 o'clock in the morning, every redneck with a gun would be out there trying to shoot one. Does anybody doubt that? No. No. And whoever got it would be on the news in the morning going, I killed the bears. I saved the village. I like his pants. Yeah. Don't laugh. I've seen them like that a lot around here. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of legends of people fighting a dragon. Gilgamesh is uh, famous for slaying a dragon. You ever heard of this story, Gilgamesh? But Gilgamesh supposedly killed a dragon. One Chinese legend tells about a man named Yu who, after a great flood, he surveyed the land of China and divided it in sections. He built channels to drain the water off to the sea and he helped make the land livable again, and many snakes and dragons were dri driven from the marshlands. Pretty interesting. This is a picture of Marduk, the chief god of the Babylonians, and he's standing on top of a dragon. See, the Bible also talks about the fiery flying serpent. Anybody ever read that in Isaiah? About the fiery flying serpents? It's in there. Herodotus, a uh, Greek historian, he wrote, I went into a certain place in Arabia, most exactly opposite the city of Buto, to make inquiries concerning winged serpents. 
On my arrival, I saw the backbones and ribs of serpents in such a number as was impossible to describe. The winged serpent is shaped like a water snake. Its wings are not feathered, but resemble very closely to those of a bat. Now, this is a, a well-known historian. Now, we've read in certain other books that uh, snakes used to fly. <coughs> Haven't we read that? I think that's kind of interesting. And uh, he said, the ribs were of a multitude, heaps so great, some small and some middle sized the place where the bones lies at the entrance of a narrow gorge between steep mountains, which there opened upon a spacious plain communicating with the great plains of Egypt. The story goes that with the spring, the winged snakes come flying from Arabia towards Egypt, but are met in this gorge by the birds called Ibis, Ibis, who forbade their entrance and destroyed them all. Pretty interesting. But look what uh, Josephus says. Anybody know who Josephus is? Yes. Yeah. Josephus says when the ground historian. was difficult. Huh? I guess he, had a Jewish he was historian. a Jewish historian. Uh, he wrote about Jesus actually in his writings. Uh, he lived after Christ a few years. But anyways, he wrote on the antiquity of the Jews. When the ground was difficult to pass over because of the multitude of serpents, which it produced in vast numbers, it's singular in some of those productions which were, which other countries do not breed. And yet, such are worse than others in power and mischief and unusual fierceness of sight. Some of them which ascend out of the ground unseen and also fly in the air. Again, we have the flying serpents. And so come upon men unaware and do the mischief. Moses invented a wonderful stratagem uh, to preserve the army safe and without hurt. For he made baskets like unto the ark of sedge and filled them with ibis. ibis and carried them along with them into battle, which the animal is the greatest enemy to the serpents imaginable. For they fly from them when they come near them, and when they, and as they fly, they are caught and devoured by them. So here we have two different people living in different centuries talking about winged serpents, and both of them have a common thread. Their enemy is an ibis. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Look what the Bible says about this animal. It says, out of his mouth, talk about the Leviathan, go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. You know, a lot of people say, you don't believe that, do you? Well, yeah, I do. Out of his nostril goes, goes smoke as of a seething potter cauldron. <laughs> you know, I've seen deacons do that. His breath kindleth coal and his flame goeth out of his mouth. And uh, I've got one of these I do on just the Leviathan. It takes a while to do it, so I'm not going to try to put it off on you guys. But if y'all are interested, we can talk about it later on. But literally, God did have a fire-breathing dragon. You know, if he can make a bug that can shoot fire, the uh, bombardier beetle, then why couldn't he make a dragon that could do it? And I don't know if any of you guys have ever read anything out of the Catholic Bible. But if you look at the Catholic Bible, in Daniel, they've got a couple extra chapters. These are part of the apocryph apocryphal books. I don't think they're scripture, but it does make for interesting reading. You'll see there a story that says, And there was a great dragon in the place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now, this is not a living God. Adore him therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but that is no living God. Give me leave or permission, O king, and I will kill this dragon without sword or club. And the king says, I give thee leave. And Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, boiled them together, and made lumps. He put them in the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. Hmm. Why do you think that would be? Well, you know, the pitch wouldn't digest, or it would be sticky. The fat would be salty taste and taste good. And the hair would clog him up. You know, so he eat these things, and he, he wouldn't have been able to get rid of them or belch or anything. It, it would scientifically cause something to burst asunder, most probably. And uh, I believe Daniel understood science pretty good. He knew what to do to get rid of this dragon. Clog him up. These were the days before Roto-Rooter. <laughs> so he didn't stand a chance. <laughs> But anyway, um, Saddam Hussein, you know, the great, 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 great grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, 
you guys, y'all, y'all heard about Saddam, I know. Uh, the name Saddam supposedly means uh, prince. Has anybody ever heard that the name Saddam means prince? Now, some of you guys that's been overseas may be able to help me with this. I noticed that uh, George Bush always called him Saddam. The same. Saddam. 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 Saddam, yeah. Saddam. Saddam means prince, and Saddam supposedly, I don't know if it's true or not, means horses rear in. He knew what he was saying. saying. It's probably and he bad was words. Wait, just publicly bad mouthing him and antagonizing him. So, some of you guys have been over there. Is, is there any truth to this? I don't know. I that's the way he said. I thought he, he just, did pronounce it that way, though. Texas, and it's just like here well, in but that, that, that's what I've always heard, though, is that's what he was doing, was insulting Saddam. So I don't know. But I thought I'd ask some of you guys while well, I was well, here. To be honest with you, I thought he was mispronouncing it when I was over there. But since I've been coming here, I'm sure that he wasn't. I thought he was being insulting. You <laughs> think he was insulting? I think Not he's a horse he's yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> I think he knew the correct way to pronounce it. Well, anyway, Saddam, the great, great grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, has done all he can to try to rebuild Babylon. He's even put his picture on her money with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it didn't do him any good to try to save his grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. We well, see where he ended up. But anyways, after they found Babylon buried under the sand, they found the remains of the Ishtar Gates. And on those gates, all over it, there was lions and bears and bulls all over it. There's a picture of one of the lions and one of the dragons. And he also put bulls on it. So why would they put a fictional animal on the wall with two real animals? Unless they really seen dragons. This is probably stylized. I don't know of anything in the fossil record that actually looks like that. But uh, why would they put a dragon on there if they didn't exist? The real gates, I think, are still in uh, a museum in Berlin. So they've had to redo the, the gate over there. But there's lots of legends of dragons. Alexander the Great reported that when he conquered parts of what's now Indian, India, that uh, his soldiers were scared off by great dragons that lived in caves. And I've got a slide that I forgot to put in here of a dragon and an elephant fighting. Um, Roman mosaics show two long-necked dragons uh, doing something there back in the second century A.D. I suppose that would really be necking, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. <laughs> He's smiling, too. He look happy. St. George is famous for slaying a dragon in 275 A.D. And if you ever read the story from uh, Beowulf, uh, he was famous for slaying the dragon Grendel. Anybody ever read this book? You have? Beowulf, yeah. yeah. Well, if you've ever read it in original English, Goodness. this is original English. I can't read that. I couldn't read that. <laughs> so now I'm illiterate in two languages. I guess that makes me a biliterally lingering. But anyways, Beowulf supposedly pulled the arm off the dragon Grendel and uh, killed it. Here's a Babylonian cylinder seal showing a man pulling an arm off a dragon. Reckon that was a way to kill some of them? Here we got what was called the slate pallet of Heraclinopolis, again showing two long-necked dragons. I've got a replica of it over here on the table if anybody wants to see it here in a little bit. Elijah's supposed to be over here handling the replicas. But again, how can this guy say that no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur? I mean, we find them all over cave drawings, uh, artwork, pottery from ancient man. Why did they carve them into cliff walls if no man had ever seen them? You know, here's a Russian medallion showing a man killing a dragon. Here's a couple of different coins of a man killing a dragon. Here's a, uh, it goes around the edge of somebody's grave. They were buried like in the floor. And this is the outline around the, the grave. It's a tomb of a bishop from the 15th century. And it's got two long-necked dragons on it. Here's a, uh, I think not a mosaic, but like an old, uh, not a hieroglyphic, is like one of those uh, things that hang up in a 
a castle, a mural, but it was a tapestry, tapestry, tapestry. yeah, thank you. A tapestry showing a guy inside of what looks like a plesiosaur and these other natives trying to get him out, trying to kill it. Now how do these guys know what a plesiosaur looked like close to a thousand years ago? A guy in 900 AD was famous for killing a dragon that had iron nails on its tail. Reckon it'd look a little bit like that? Hand me that gap. You know, this is one of the tail spikes Just hand it here. from a stegosaurus. That might look like an iron nail to somebody who didn't know any better. Here you go, Gap. The Vikings used to put dragon heads all over their ships so they would blend in with some of these water dragons. They uh, had woodcut carvings of a dragon swallowing a man. Mm -hmm. No, why would they put something like that if they'd never seen a thing like that? You know, Siegfried's famous for slaying the uh, dragon Fafner. And I don't think all this mythology is necessarily true, but I think everything has a, a toehold in reality. You know, these, these myths come from somewhere. Marco Polo lived in China for 17 years, around 1271. And he reported that the emperor raised dragons to pull his chariots in parades. Now, why would he uh, need dragons to pull his chariots if he didn't have dragons? 1611, uh, the post of royal dragon feeder was added to the law books. And a lot of books there told about them raising dragons for the medicinal purposes. Now, why would you appoint somebody to be royal dragon feeder unless you needed them to feed the dragons? And Marco Polo, you know, as far as I know, is a fairly truthful fellow. The city of Nerluth, France, was renamed in honor of the man who slayed the dragon there. It is described as being bigger than an ox and had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. Think it could have been something like that? The Indians uh, carved pictures of dinosaurs on the Grand Canyon. Looks kind of similar to this animal, doesn't it? And this was an American dinosaur. They had to have seen it to know what it looked like. Here's another drawing. I don't know if you can make that out from there. It looks pretty fuzzy from right here. Different kind of dinosaur. Carved there on the page. But anyway, this guy, he said related to a prehistoric man, uh, talking about these carvings. The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of dinosaurs on the wall of this canyon upsets completely all the, our theories regarding the antiquity of man. Facts are stubborn and immutable things. If theories do not square with the facts, then the theories must change. The facts remain. Amen. Well, maybe you ought to just get rid of your dumb theories. And this guy said, about a year ago, a photographer of the dinosaur was shown to a scientist of national repute who, when he then specializing in dinosaurs, he said, it is not a dinosaur, it is impossible because we know that dinosaurs were extinct 12 million years before man appeared on the earth. Now notice he said 12 million years. 12 million. Yes. Now, aren't they telling the kids now that it's 70 million? I mean, that's what they tell us in school all the time. Back in 1770, George Boothman said the earth was 70,000 years old. In 1905, the age of the Earth was officially 2 billion years old. In 1969, the Earth was 3.5 billion years old. And today, it's 4.6 or 4 billion years old. That means the Earth has been getting older at a rate of 21 million years per year. Per year. For the last 220 years. That's 40 years a minute. That's stupid is what that is. <laughs> there in Utah, they also found more dinosaur carvings on the walls. You can see the outline there. Here in Australia, not here in Australia, but in Australia, they've got a picture of dragons on the cave walls and a man running away from it. Up in Ontario, Canada, there's a dragon-like creature painted on the walls there. It kind of looks like a Pterodactyl down here, too, if you can see it better. And then if you look at some of the evidence from Ica, Peru. Down in Ica, Peru, 
It's the driest desert, driest place on the earth. It's only rained a few inches in the last several hundred years down there. It's one of the driest deserts anywhere. But in uh, between 1535 and 1571, the Spanish conquistadors mentioned that there were stones with strange creatures carved on them. And they sent them back to the king going, you know, what are these? He's like, well, I don't know. But uh, if you look at them, these stones are really unusual. They've got dinosaurs carved all over them alongside of man. They even, some of these stones show, show them doing heart surgery and brain surgery. But how, there's like 15,000 of these stones been found so far. And there's 15 of them in the United States, different museums have bought and brought here. But how did these people, back in the 1500s, know what a dinosaur looked like to put it on to put it on a rock. I mean, the first skeleton was found in the early 1800s. Nobody had any way of knowing what a dinosaur looked like up to that point. Because supposedly no living human being had ever seen a dinosaur. But yet, these Ica stones have nearly every variety of dinosaur on it. Oh, and there's 50,000 of those stones, not 15, I'm sorry. And they show, I mean, dinosaurs fighting, men riding dinosaurs, dinosaurs eating men. Can anybody tell what that one is? Triceratops. Triceratops. I mean, you can clearly see that it's a dinosaur. You don't have to argue about it. You're not going to confuse that with a llama. You know? Here's a, here's a guy cutting the head off a dinosaur and another guy inside of it. I guess he's trying to show that he got revenge on it for eating his buddy or something. Where is the inside? You uh, see this guy right here, his body? But this guy's cutting the head off this dinosaur. Maybe oh, he's trying yeah. to rescue him. I'm not sure what's Maybe going on. Maybe he swallowed him, huh? He's trying to get him out. Yeah, that's kind of what it looks like there. <laughs> but these ancient peoples obviously seen dinosaurs. And notice also that they've got circles on the skin. Why would they put circles all over the skin of these dinosaurs? Well, several years ago, somebody found fossilized dinosaur skin. It was the first, fossil, the first dinosaur skin that had been found and it had circular patterns on the skin. I mean, I think that's a really interesting fact there. And we find dinosaurs uh, on pottery. This is, uh, where was this at? This is also Ica, Peru. Uh, one of the mummies they found in there, because people would bury it, it was on one of their pottery jars. And on the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the poncho, I guess, that the Indian was wearing, or one of the blankets, there's dinosaurs woven into the fabric, all over it. That's a pretty good picture of what it looks like there. But how, I mean, I keep asking, how I wanted to get through to you, how did people know what a dinosaur looked like if man had never seen them? If dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago? And down in Acambaro, Mexico, they keep finding clay figurines of dinosaurs. Ancient. 56,000 of them so far. Ceramic figurines of dinosaurs. There was a Barney fan back then. There must have been. <laughs> Maybe there was a Barney invasion. Of course, they're not too happy. They don't like people coming down there and nosing around, you know, because they don't want to be made famous for disproving the theory of evolution. So, uh... They don't like people down there. But still, we see over and over that they try to tell us nobody's ever seen a live dinosaur. Well, if they didn't, how did they carve them on cave walls? Why did they weave them into their fabrics and make pictures of them? Well, maybe the world's just not as old as they think it is. This guy, I think it was in, in Italy, is famous for uh, killing a little dragon that he found, a little skinny thing. He hit it on top of the head with a stick and killed it. And they had it in a museum over there for a while. Uh, everybody that had seen it described it this way. Apparently it was a Tanistrophius. That's a mouthful. And we'll learn that, uh, or they'll try to tell you in school, that Columbus was the first white man to sail across the ocean. Well, that's not true at all. There's people coming over here. Do you know Hebrew coins from the time of Christ have been found buried in uh, Indian mounds, not Indian mounds, but burial mounds in the upper north of the United States? The Romans come over here and traded a lot, and uh, they left artifacts. 
And one of the artifacts that was dug up in 1925 has a dinosaur on it. You know, the guy that owns the thing now, when he's asked about it, what do you think about this? He said, well, it couldn't possibly, here's the real sword, he said it couldn't possibly be a real dinosaur because they died off millions of years ago. Well, now, can you see how this theory of evolution impedes real science? If you find a piece of evidence, you don't go, hey, well, that don't jive with our theory. Let's throw it away. Well, you need to take it all into account before you come up with what you're saying is an exact science. It's a mad doctor science is what it is. And uh, this right here, this is what's known as the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone. It's about 80 to 100 tons. It has the Ten Commandments on it in Byzantine Samaria. It's dated about 500 to 600 years A.D. Why was somebody here trying to teach the Ten Commandments back then? And writing in Samaritan. But during the great age of the sailing ships, a lot of people reported seeing uh, <coughs> dragons in the water. Whoa, come back here. Hans Ege was a missionary to Greenland, and he drew this sketch of a sea monster he said he saw off the coast of Greenland. Now, a lot of these reports are from Christians that we're, that we're going to see here. But uh, Hans Ege's diary, I believe this is what I got. This is a page out of his diary. It says, As for other sea monsters, none of them have been seen by us or by any of our time that I could, that I could ever hear, save the most dreadful monster that showed itself upon the surface of the water in the year 1734 off our new colony in 64 degrees. This monster was so huge a size that coming out of the water, his head reached as high as the mast as the masthead. Its body was as bulky as the ship and three or four times as long. It had a long pointed snout and sprouted like a whalefish, great broad paws, and a body seemed covered with shell work. Its skin was very rugged and uneven. The under part of its body was shaped like a huge serpent, and it dived under the water. It plunged backward into the sea and so raised its tail aloft, which seemed that whole ships length and distance <coughs> from the bulkiest part of its body. Uh, sea monster sightings in Natural History of Norway by Bishop Eric, I can't pronounce that, but he claims that he saw a sea monster. A 60-foot sea monster seen by Captain Peter McKay and the crew of the HMS Daedalus was reported in 1848. His uh, crew went to him and said, Captain, please don't put this in the log book. They're going to make fun of us if you do it. He was even called in and rep reprimanded by his superiors. Well, what are you talking about sea monsters? You're going to scare people. But he said it was the truth, and he had to report it. In the 1850s, the whaling ship, the, Man the Ma blah, blah, blah. Monongahela. Monongahela, yeah, out of New Bedford, claimed to have killed a 103-foot sea monster in the Pacific Ocean. The sailors said that it had two blowholes, four swim fins, an alligator-like head, and 94 very sharp teeth. And a passing ship actually stopped by and saw this thing with them and bought some of the uh, sea serpent oil. They melted it down, and people like to they'd sell bear oil and different things anytime they kill an animal. So they tried to get some of the fat off of it, and they melted it down, and this ship bought some of the ser sea serpent oil. And... Uh, they said that they were going to go on and do some whaling, and they'd be back later, <laughs> or end later. But the Mon Monongahela sailed off in search of whales, and it was never heard from again. Apparently, it went down in a storm. But the other ship, who had the sea serpent oil, reported the story. people reported. It was on April 26, 1907, while chief officer of the Campania, that Arthur Henry Rolston sighted off the Irish coast near Cork Island, a long-necked object, which he sketched as it moved, turning its head from side to side. Rolston stated that at the time, what he saw and sketched was a sea serpent. That's in the book, Titanic Triumph and Tragedy. 
But the next phrase in the book says, however imaginative the young officer may have been, it did not interfere with his progress in the company's service. Have you seen any kind of uh, prejudice in there? Automatically calling him imaginative? Like if you say you saw a sea monster, you've got to be crazy. A German ship during World War II, I believe it was, sank a German ship, or a British ship, and they said that after the ship exploded underwater, a 60-foot sea creature come flying out of the water. Must have been interesting. And there have been a lot of counts of giant octopuses attacking ships. You know, this is a story from out of the Philippines where these fishermen in a boat with pontoons on it said that an octopus drug them down. Drug them under the water. This is a picture of an octopus that washed up on the beach of St. Augustine, Florida in 1896. What is an octopus? That's an octopus. That's the head part of it. Its tentacles and everything, according to this newspaper, it was 200 feet across. That's a big octopus. And uh, a few years ago, a whale that was killed near Seattle, it was cut open. It had a 150-foot octopus arm in its stomach. You know, whales like to uh, eat octopus. They like to eat them. They eat a lot of octopus. As a matter of fact, they'll eat so much that they'll get sick, and then they'll throw it back up. And if you ever find a piece of puked-up octopus, you better get it and bring it home. Does anybody here know what they do with puked-up octopus? Do you know, sons, what they do with it? Perfume. They make perfume out of it. That explains a lot, don't it, fellas? Next time you're feeling loving towards your wife, don't be afraid to tell her, hey, baby, you smell like a pooped up octopus. That ought to make her happy. But it's called ambergris. It's a great waxy material and sub, uh, substance. It's secreted by whales, and it's used in making perfume. In 1966, off the United States coast, a Navy ship reported seeing a giant squid attacking a sperm whale. And they find dead whales a lot of times. They'll have great old big saucer-shaped mm. circles on them where they've been attacked by a giant, giant squid. There's a picture of a giant squid. Not a picture, but a uh, replica of a giant squid. This baby giant squid washed up in, uh, where is this? New Zealand. And they say it was about 80 feet long, all of it. They said if it was grown, it would have been about 150 feet across, or 50 feet long. So if all this is true about dinosaurs living with man, are dinosaurs really mentioned in the Bible? Well, we'll look at that in a couple of minutes. You know, the Bible tells us that there was a man named Job, and he was perfect, and he feared God, and he sheweth evil. He hated evil. And he had, on the wire, you know, and he had seven sons and three daughters. And one day, this guy come to him, he said, listen, uh, well, actually, he had a lot, about a thousand sheep, a thousand camels, hundreds of oxen, hundreds of asses, and he was one of the greatest men in the East. And one day, a man comes to him, his messenger, and says, you know, the oxen and the ashes, the Sabians fell on them, took them away, and have slain your servants. And fire burned up the sheep and your servants, and the camels, they were carried away with them. He is having a real bad day. A Hebrew stock market crash. He did stock market. Okay, never mind. And then another guy comes and says, your sons and your daughters were killed. They're all dead. And uh, that discouraged Job, but it didn't bring him down. He said, and the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you were having that kind of day, do you think you'd still be blessing the Lord? And Satan wasn't happy doing that, so he wouldn't give Job boils all over. And then his wife turned against him, telling him, curse God and die. You know, Job just about lost everything. And then things got really bad for him because his friends showed up to comfort him. That's really when it gets bad, ain't it? And one of his friends was the shortest man known of in the Bible, Bill Dad the Shoe Height. Little fella. (laughs) 
And they told him, Job, this is all happened to you because you're a sinner, you know. Whoever perished being innocent. You know, that's the wisdom of the world, man. You're having a bad day, so you must have sinned. You've done something wrong. God's punishing you. You know, if your friend is having trouble, go there and love him, comfort him. Just be there for him. But you know, <coughs> you know don't go to him when he's in the hospital going, hey, uh, these gallstones you're having to move, those aren't uh, gallstones. They're tithes and offerings. God's getting them out of you somehow. But let's take that to its limit. Everybody died, so everybody must have been different, you know. Yeah. I mean, but, but isn't that what people usually say? Well, he's having that trouble because he must be doing something. Doing something punishment. wrong. Yeah, he's doing something wrong. You know, don't be going to your buddy and doing stuff at him. Tell him those aren't gallstones. Those are tithes and offerings. You know, that's what we do if somebody has bad luck. Well, God's going to get it out of you one way or another. God ain't that kind of person. But Job, he finally did break down. He says, oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me. And the Bible tells us, well, anyway, before I get that, I was about to jump ahead of myself. He says he wished that the Almighty would answer him. He wanted to know why it was happening. You know, he was having a bad day. And I guess he wanted to know, why? Why is it happening? Well, Job didn't know about Romans 8, 28. But it was coming. You know, we know that all things work together for good of them that love God and them that are called according to his purpose. This was in effect for Job. He just didn't know about it. Let's say, for instance, have you ever been hungry? Uh -huh. Ever been really hungry? Uh -huh. I suppose you come to my house and go, hey, John, I'm starving. Can you help me out? And I'll say, well, sure, come on in. How about a cup of flour? That'll get spot, won't it? <laughs> well, if you don't like that, yeah, well, how about, uh, how about a teaspoon of salt? Uh -huh. We'll give you that. Don't want a teaspoon of salt? Better yet, baking soda. Let's get you some baking soda. Mm -hmm. you got to be getting pretty dry by now, so tilt your head back. Let's get you a cup of Crisco. Mm -hmm. Half a cup. We're watching our cholesterol. You ready to leave your house. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. Don't leave yet. Well, how about wash it down with some buttermilk? That'd be better. Oh, that make, sounds make good to biscuits. me. <laughs> but what if we uh, put them all together and we made biscuits? Make me some biscuits. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the individual ingredients are terrible. But they work together for biscuits. Just like a lot of times we have bad things going on in our lives, these bad things work together for our good. Amen. They make us some spiritual biscuits. That's right. And, you know, all we need to do is make sure that we trust God and keep our heart right with Him. And it's harder than you think. Well, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We all think we know our spiritual condition, but we don't. But anyway, the Lord finally he answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, and I think if somebody spoke to me out of a whirlwind, I'm going to listen. But anyway, he spoke to him and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins and like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer. Uh, demand of thee and answer thou me. You know, God asked Job question after question after question. He never did tell him why the bad things happened to him, but he asked him several questions. He said, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's right. Yeah. I mean, Job couldn't answer that. He wasn't around. And, you know, you might wonder, why would God ask him a question like that? A lot of these questions were designed to change Job's attitude. You know, he's God. He don't have to tell you why something bad happened. Declare if thou will. If thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? By the way, do you know that science didn't even know there were springs in the sea until 1977? Which proves the Bible right again. It says, where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? Now that's a really interesting wording right there. Where is the way where light dwelleth? Light has a way. It's always moving. But darkness has a place. It goes nowhere. <clears throat> scientific question there without even really knowing it was scientific. But it, light does have a way. By what way is the light parted which scattered the east winds upon the earth? Did you know that was a scientific statement right there? Did you know that the sunlight makes the wind? The sun heats the air and it expands and... <laughs> 
it blows. The sun dictates the wind. So by what way is the light parted which scattered the east wind upon the earth? You know, Job's almost a science, science book. There's also a place in Job that says the face of the deep is frozen as a stone. Now how did a man living in the desert know that there was a place in the world where the ocean was frozen over? Thank God uh, give him that bit of information. It says, can thou sense the lightning? I'm glad I can't. How many people here are glad that you can't send the lightning? How many of you think of somebody who's lucky to be alive because you can't send the lightning? <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people that's lucky to be here because I can't send the lightning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Has thou an arm like God, or can thou thunder with a voice like him? You know, God asked him question after question, 84 by my account. But, uh, you know, I think he was trying to change his attitude. These are the kind of questions like we ask our kids sometimes. You know, they come in and go, hey, Dad, I think I ought to be allowed to stay out to four in the morning with my friends. You know, after all, I'm 10. Well, you know, and how many of you dads, and I want to talk about, you know, your kids get a little older, and they say, well, I think I ought to be able to do this, or I think I should be able to do that. Well, that's the kind of questions Job was being asked. You know, the ones like, all right, you think you ought to be able to stay out late tonight. Well, let me ask you something. Where was you when we got this house and cleared off the land, run off the grizzly bear? You know, who pays the bills here? You know, who pays for that food that you eat and eat and eat and eat? Who pays for those clothes you're wearing? You know, who pays for the insurance here? Who pays for the electricity? Who pays for the water and the soap you used to take a bath with about a week ago? You know, answer me these questions. Because i got to tell you, Whosoever pays the bills makes the rules. That's second, second opinions, 4-7. <laughs> you know, me, Dad, you kid. If you want to do it differently, you get you a job and start bringing in the money. You start bringing in the gold. You know, the golden rule says he that make it the gold, make it the rules. Second opinions, 5-9. But, you know, this was really, I think, all about changing Job's attitude. And then he told him, he said, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee, uh, made with these, he eateth the grass as an ox. And if you look a lot of times what, uh, about the scripture in the Bible, you find uh, footnotes in the side of it that says, supposed to be either an elephant or a hippopotamus. Well, you know, it says, behold now behemoth, which I made with thee to eat grass as an ox. Well, an elephant eats grass, don't it? And a hippo eats grass. He said, now his strength is in his loins and the force is in the navel of his belly. So behemoth would have a big belly. Elephant's got a big belly. Hippo's got a big belly. Brachiosaurus got a big belly. This guy's got a big belly. <laughs> so does he. <laughs> yeah, that's just wrong. <laughs> But uh, it also says, he moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. He moveth his tail like a cedar. You ever seen an elephant's tail? That's a pretty scraggly cedar tree, you think? It's What about this guy? That's not like a cedar tail either, or cedar tree either. That'd look pretty funny like that, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> It's the footnotes in the Bible says possibly a hippopotamus or an elephant. You think before they put these footnotes in there, they might ought to read the Bible? You know, the Bible's inspired, the footnotes aren't. It says his bones are strong pieces of brass, and his bones are like bars of iron. This is a toe bone from a Brachiosaurus. I've got one right here, a replica of it. Let me tell you, it's heavy. This is the second phalange in, in his toe. And this is going to be pretty complicated to figure out. He had big toe bones because he had big toes. <laughs> Here's a kid playing in a dinosaur footprint down in Glen Rose, Texas. So he had pretty big feet. And he had big feet because he had to hold up big legs. A 20-foot leg right there. Think that's a big animal? The biggest one ever found was like 60 feet. They say it's going to be 20 years to dig it out. Take that long. 
Must be a government project. <laughs> you know, the biggest one found was about 100 tons, they estimate. That's the weight of about 14 school buses. That's a big animal. If he come along and stepped on you, you'd be greatly impressed by him. <laughs> or depressed, I'm not sure. We got any teachers there who can tell us which one would be? Recessed. Yeah, be repressed. The Bible says, he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword, or he that made him can make his sword approach unto him. He's the chief of the ways of God. It means, it's a word, reshit. It means the beginning, the chief, or the principal thing. The biggest thing God made. I mean, don't sound like an elephant to me. But it does describe something like a brachiosaurus. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can use his sword to approach unto him. Don't know why it's in there. Why? I'd like to see April about that. And the Bible tells us that God created the great whales and every living thing that moveth. So God obviously created dinosaurs. See, and Satan, he probably thought, how in the world can I use these dinosaurs against God? You know, he couldn't go to Adam and say, hey, uh, do you know I made the dinosaurs? Adam go, what's wrong with you? Back in the backyard, I just got through feeding him. And he couldn't treat Noah. You know, Noah fed him every day. But over the next 4,000 years, as they begin to die off, Satan was able to use them to lie and take people away from God. By saying, they evolved over millions of years. They, by 1809, most dinosaurs were gone, and people had completely forgotten about them until they found the skeleton. And he uses them every day, right here in Montgomery County, to, to trick little kids. He starts them out young. If you ask any little kid, you go, when did dinosaurs live? First thing they're going to holler is, millions of years ago. Well, no, they didn't. But your kids are going to be taught that Monday in this town at your expense. Your tax dollars are going to take your children away from God if you're not very careful. You think there'll be some books like this in the public library or the school libraries? And it really makes me mad when I go somewhere like a museum and I see them taking these kids around telling them that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. It's a lie. God made them. He should get the credit. And then Job says, He lieth under the shady trees and the coverts of the reeds and the fins. You know the biggest swamp in the world is the Lickwalla Swamp. It's 55,000 square miles and it's 80%. That, that's the United States compared to it. 80% unexplored. There's been 30 or so uh, explorations been there in the last 30 years, and they all come out saying, or over the last 100 years, I'm sorry, over the last 100 years, there's been about 30 different expeditions there, and they all come out saying, there's dinosaurs living in the Lickwalla Swamp. This one washed up on California shores back in 1925. It had a 20-foot neck on it. I mean, I mean, some really good pictures. You can't argue with it. You can see the eye right here. E.L. Wallace, president of the National History Society in British Columbia, said, my examination of the monster was quite thorough. It had no teeth, its head was large, and its neck fully 20 feet long. Its body weak and its tail only three feet in length from the end of the backbone, with a bill like it was Wait, with a bill like it possesses, it must have lived on herbage and undoubtedly inhabited a swamp. I would call it a type of plesiosaur. Another witness, Judge W.R. Springer of Santa Cruz, felt the creature was from a prehistoric age. He added his observations evidence of, uh, were evidence of two short feet or flippers and probably swam with its head high above the water. 1925, off the coast of California. You know, most likely some kind of a plesiosaur, like they said. It certainly looks like it. 20 foot neck. One atheist said uh, it's probably just a rare form of whale. Well, can you show me a neck on a whale? Anybody ever seen a neck on a whale? 
And then they always try to feed you this lie right here. Dinosaurs turned to birds. Anybody ever seen that lie? Yeah. That's stupid. Um, if you've ever watched Jurassic Park, you can see this. In the first one, you had your velociraptors. And uh, as the series progressed, the velociraptors got more feathers on it and more and more. Pay attention if you ever see it again. You know, the birds were made on the fifth day. The reptiles were made on the sixth day. And they're always trying to, to sell you this lie, though. Dinosaurs alive, as birds, scientists said. And they found that scientists unveiled missing link of birds and dinosaurs. Did they really? Huh. That was in 1999. They had it all over National Geographic. Look at it. It looks so accurate, doesn't it? That's just scary. <laughs> Look, notice the feathers, how it's evolution of the dinosaur there. Dinosaur bird link smashed in fossil flap. It was a hoax. But yet it was the newest, greatest evidence for evolution. And then they've come up with these feathered dinosaurs that they found. Sorry guys, wrong again. They aren't feathered dinosaurs. They found out that the fossils were oxidized manganese that leaked into the around the dinosaur, just gave it the appearance of a, a soft, fluffy down all over it. It's still just a dinosaur. Birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. Okay. It takes a lot more than just saying it and putting a few feathers on it and giving him a push to make a bird into a, a dinosaur into a bird. Have you ever thought about it? How useless would a partly evolved, evolved bird be? Cat's going to have a field day with that. <laughs> but yet, here it is. The Archaeopteryx. Fossil of Archaeopteryx are about 150 million years old and show bird-like features and dinosaur-like features. Here is again. Archaeopteryx. You know the name means ancient wings. They say there's such great proof that he's a part dinosaur because he's got some claws on his wing and he had teeth in his feet. This guy says, uh, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Archaeopteryx, Archaeopteryx had all the brain features of a bird equipped for flight. It means ancient wing, claws on his wing there. But there's a lot of other birds that have claws on their wings. Do you know the ostrich has claws on its wings? It does. And they say, well, it was a reptile because it's got teeth in its beak. Well, here's a little bird from, I believe it's Brazil or Panama, that has 48 teeth in its mouth. Does that make it a precursor for a dinosaur? No. You know, some of you have teeth and some don't. Just like some birds have teeth and some don't. Teeth do not prove evolution. And here's another uh, article on that dino bird. They think that the Archaeopteryx, like it, is fake too. I think that's actually the newest research has done that says that uh, Archaeopteryx was a fake, just like the China bird. But they still want to tell you birds are descendants of dinosaurs. Bird feathers evolved from the same scales that protected the dinosaurs so well. Feathers are the one feature that enabled birds to fly. Well, there's a piece of science the kids didn't have. But how can Archaeopteryx be a uh, evolutionary point, a missing link of birds, when they have 130-year-old crow skeletons that's older than Archaeopteryx is supposed to be? He can't be a missing link to a bird if you've already got a bird. That's just dumb. You know, some problems with reptiles to bird evolution theory is the lungs are totally different. They have two different kinds of lungs, totally. And modern birds are found in layers with and lower than dinosaurs. We've always had birds. Scales and feathers attach to the body differently. They develop from different genes and chromosomes. But because they're both made of keratin, then they want to say, oh, well, they're the same thing. Well, no. You know, the fact that it's a, it's a common design just shows we have a common designer, not a common ancestor. 
birds have a four-chambered heart, and most rep reptiles only have a three-chambered heart. Reptiles lay leathery eggs, unlike birds. You know, in the uh, hips and reproductive areas of birds and uh, reptiles are different. You see a big difference. Let's see. The origin of bird is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil evidence of the stages through which the remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. The experts strongly disagree about the evidence. We don't observe it today. All they found for evidence are stories of how it might have happened. You know, it violates observable science and God's word and popular opinion and common sense. But we're going to cover a lot more about dinosaurs that are still living in our next session. I hope you'll stick around, and I'll try to get through it a little quicker than I did this. Thanks a lot, guys.